All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our final talk in this weekend's conference. So we have closing up our weekend, Patricia Walsh. Her topic is soul dramas, how to read the script. And I'm just really joyed. I always love getting to sit in, in anything that Patricia does. And I just deeply admire the work that she does. Um, for those that don't know, she's deeply steeped in evolutionary astrology and past life regression therapy. She combines the two. She has a really great book that correlates the two that I highly recommend. So Patricia, take it away. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I bet you you're exhausted by now if you've been sitting in on all the lectures, but I'm sure you're also inspired and invigorated. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because Friday I came down with a head cold and the two remaining brain cells that I have are still looking for each other in the fog. So, <laughs> so due to that, I may be needing to pause and gather my thoughts. Um, okay, so what I want to talk to you about is um, certainly where Deva started. I was here at the beginning, um, the Pluto method, which is the foundation of evolutionary astrology. Uh, because I do regression, um, and you know, I wrote about all that stuff in my book. It, it regression and the stories really illustrate how these dynamics are living in a person. And that's one of my favorite things to do is to share these kinds of stories, the resolution, the inner life of these past life selves, how the complexes were formed. So I'm gonna um intersperse some of that in this case study that I'm gonna share with you. Um so. I want to start with just a quick outline just to remind people. So we start with Pluto, right? And people often, I know because I teach to um, evolutionary astrology and quite frequently students are always asking, well, what's the difference between Pluto and the nodes, right? Like how is that actually in our psyche? And to me, well, I, in, in a simple way, you can kind of look at it like two nodal axes, Pluto and its polarity point and south node to north node. In principle, I think you can kind of put it in your head that way. But Pluto, as we know in evolutionary astrology, has always been associated with bottom line psychology. What does that mean? Um, bottom line psychology, in, in Vedantic thought, uh, philosophy, there's a word for it. It's called the klesa. So there's a difference between klesas and samskaras. And a klesha, I've used this analogy before and I find it very useful. It's, it, it, they say that a klesha is like a, the perfume, the scent of the perfume left behind on a cloth. So it's not the perfume itself, it's the scent of the perfume. Now, what I want you to imagine is if you had, you know, a cloth with perfume on it and you went to a room and then you left and somebody else came in the room, that scent would be pervasive, probably subtle yet pervasive. That is Pluto. OK, so when we think of that as a karmic dynamic, that represents tendencies. So, yes, all of the contents of past life memory is there. Um, past life wounding, specifically in Pluto, emotional wounds to the soul. Um, but but it's more the extracted um, conclusions that the soul has made about that. And I'm not talking mental, right? I'm talking these kinds of conclusions that lead to particular pro propensities. Like you can say to yourself, I'm an introvert, but there's maybe you were, you know, you were born an introvert, whatever. There's no particular incidents that you can point to that caused you to become introverted, right? It's a tendency. So we can say, we can look at Pluto like that. And, and I made an analogy in my book about Pluto being the drummer in a band, right? And, and, and the reason is when you go and see a band and you listen to music, you're not always, unless you're a drummer, you're not always conscious of, you know, the drummer, but your, your muscle memory is going along with the beat. You're moving with the beat. You're not even really thinking about it. That's Pluto. And so as a bottom line psychology, another way to think of it is when we look at Pluto by house and sign, 
uh, at least what I do, and I'm sharing my experience, some of it may deviate slightly from the book Evolutionary Astrology, but it's what I've been doing in practice. Um, house and sign, for sure, right? So the sign is, we know, a generational psychology. But, you know, in a lot of esoteric teachings, they do teach that souls incarnate in groups, right? Which is why you get certain themes for each generation. Um, and if that whole generation was doing regression, they would find maybe that they've all had similar kinds of experiences. Um, you know, one that I can always point to being a Pluto Virgo myself are that a lot of Pluto Virgos on the planet today are the ones that were at the forefront of this body, mind, spirit movement, alternative healing, all of that, right? Well, many of the Pluto Virgos that I work with quite frequently go back to these herbalist healer lives or those that were persecuted as witches, right? So we could say that as that's a group that's reincarnating. Um, and then their appearance on the planet brings, you know, particular themes and changes to society uh, to the forefront. So, um, so you can also think of it like this. Pluto is like, I call it the soul's experiment. So the soul decides to experiment with an archetype, right? And once the soul sets its foot on that path of saying, I'm going to experiment with, uh, let's stick with Virgo, Virgo, uh, it will then, through a series of lifetimes, um, experience all of the different facets and aspects and permutations of that archetype so as to come out the end of it as a full integration of that archetype. So, you know, we can talk about, let's say even Leo, we can talk about Leo as a sense of, you know, we say in evolutionary astrology, the, the bottom line psychology and soul drive of a Pluto Leo or a fifth house Pluto would be this um, desire for self-actualization, a drive to self-actualize. Well, then we can start to extract some of the things that the soul has experienced in that experiment with self-actualization, which can be, and again, when we go to Pluto, you know, another way I always think of it is when you think of an archetype and you're reading it first from the karmic level, you're going to say, what could go wrong with this archetype? <laughs> Right. <laughs> like what could be some of the possible blocks, problems, complexes, issues that come up with this archetype? So, you know, Pluto and Leo can be all of these different permutations of being estranged from one's talent, being trapped by one's like a prodigy. Right. Being we've seen this in history, uh, you know, then maybe the expression of one's talent, but then the loss of it. So then this complex forms around this sense of giftedness, talent, um, self-expression, whatever. And, it, and that becomes this kind of, let's say, a complex around giftedness. That then, because of the nature of karma, and I just want to say this out front for those of you who haven't heard me say this before, um, <laughs> The Western notion of karma of this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth thing is a kind of Judeo-Christian overlay. Karma is, of course, derived uh, from the, the words to do, it's action. Yes, we can say it's consequences of one action, one's actions. But then to understand consequences of one's action also means the reactions that have been met and what's been internalized and imprinted in the soul and the psyche as a result of that. And we would call that, i.e. trauma. So trauma then, we have to understand that the nature of trauma and the way that it impacts the psyche, which is way too long the conversation for tonight, but some of it I will be illustrating, is that um, it's repetitive. It's like the soul gets stuck in a groove. And this is what leads us to some stars to the south node. So then the south node again. Now, the other thing I'm going to say about Pluto when you're looking at the, you know, that's where my eye goes first to a chart. I'm going to look at Pluto house sign. I'm going to look at special conditions. What might be some of those special conditions? Retrogrades, close to a house cusp, aspect, right? 
all of those things are going to give me, and through synthesizing those, are going to give me a picture of this kind of extracted tendency, bottom line psychology. Then moving to the south node, we're now looking at the dynamics of that. You know, as, as Jeffrey always says, it's the evolving ego. Well, what is our ego? It's our emotional body, our physical body, and our mental body, the subtle bodies of those that carry the wounds. Yes, the body dies at death. The subtle bodies do not, right? This is again what they teach in Vedantic philosophy, which is this idea of karma as being eye for an eye, tooth for tooth is not necessarily the picture. You know, they talk about these layers like rough and dolls. Well, our subtle bodies are like that and everything that's been imprinted in a lifetime that is not integrated, that is not healed, that is not whatever is imprinted in the, in the subtle body. So the etheric physical, the etheric energy body, which is counterpart to the physical body, carries those imprints, right? So you can find, you know, swords and ropes and <laughs> ropes around necks and stuff in somebody's etheric body, um, in the etheric physical. And then we have the emotional body, which does the same, right? There's blocked grief and anger and all of those things that have been repressed, unexpressed, or overdone, et cetera, imprinted in the etheric, in the emotional astral body. And then there's the mental body uh, and the mental body. So uh, the mental body, of course, comprised of certain um, conclusions that we've drawn, thoughts, repetitive thoughts, um, things that we have internalized as thought patterns, perceptions, perspectives, et cetera, thoughts, ideas, blah, 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 in the mental body. So the south node then is going to show us this evolving ego, which is the combination of all three of those subtle bodies. So when the spirit leaves the body, um, and I'm using word soul and spirit as separate dynamics of our total uh, consciousness, when spirit leaves the body, it sheds that clothing. This is in the Vedas all over the place. They talk about this, right? The golden swan leaves the nest in the Bhagavad Gita, um, and it sheds this clothing. And, and that's the subtle bodies, right? So spirit always returns to its highest plane. Spirit belongs to the upper Vardos. Soul, on the other hand, carries these imprints. And when soul reincarnates, it picks up where it left off. Just like when you walk out the door, you put on your jacket. <laughs> Right, soul does the same. You know, it kind of it kind of dissolves and then comes back together, picking up where it left. And all of those what they call some scars, which do translate to scars or wounds to the soul, are in all those subtle bodies. So you pick up where you left off, um, and that's the repetition compulsion because so much of this is unconscious. It's an unconscious dynamic which is why we find ourselves repeating these patterns. Freud, um, Freud illustrated this in his studies on trauma, where he talked about repetition compulsion as a phenomena that happens as a result of trauma. Um, for example, you know, somebody is uh, abused. Uh, some say it's a woman abused, maybe when she's young, and she will continue to draw to her abusers. You know, I always use the example if she could walk in a bar where there's 13 nice guys and one abuser and magnetically she's kind of drawn to the abuser. This is an unconscious dynamic of, of what Freud called repetition compulsion and what plays out in one life is true for the many lives of the soul. So we find ourselves in these karmic quandaries, right? What I call karmic complexes. Um, and then, so we're, this is what we're seeing in the South Node. We're seeing some of the dynamics of that, the different layers of imprinting that's there. And again, also looking at special conditions, way too much to go into here, but as you all know, there's a lot of special conditions to the nodes um, that, that um, uh, sorry, brain cells <laughs> connect. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of different dynamics that like such as a square to the nodes, which is a huge departure in the way that evolutionary astrology looks at squares to the nodes. So let's let's get to a case study here. 
Okay, so this is a client uh, student studied evolutionary astrology with Rose, Marcus, and Laura and I in our school, um, and also is a current regression student of mine. Um, so she is uh, just a few little information about her history. She is a 30 um, ish. Brazilian woman. Um, she, let me see what else we want to know about her. She, if you've seen the, I always laugh with her and say, because um, I walked below deck Mediterranean. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. I think it's on like TLC or something. I DVR it and I watch it in bed. It puts me to sleep. And it's about um, the yacht, you know, yacht, but like super yachts and the, the crews that work on them and all of the you know, interpersonal dynamics and stuff like that. She's one of those, that's what she does all over the world um, for the rich and famous. She's doing that now, that's not all that she's ever done. Um, she has a history, a uh, deep spiritual history, studying um, uh, esoteric forms of Tibetan Buddhism, yoga, um, different forms of Eastern uh, traditions uh, um, like India, been to India, uh, had a guru, has a Tibetan uh, guru now. Um, so that's clearly going to put her into third somewhere in third stage individuated into first stage spiritual, uh, more into first stage spiritual in my estimation. She talks about having, no, let me just stop there and say, can we see some of that evidence in her chart? right? Just looking at some of the tendencies. Well, certainly we have a, a, a Jupiter in the 12th house that square the nodes. Um, we have a Pluto in, uh, in score. Sorry, again, the brain, you're going to have to stick with me. Pluto and Scorpio in the sixth retrograde. Um, so, you know, we can already see again, soul's desire for wanting to know the answer, wanting to know why wanting to dig deep, wanting to look into the self. And with the retrograde, we know that this is a force in the soul that basically says, get to the bottom line of your desires, get to what drives you, what are your motives, right? It's, a, it's an urge to purification, emphasized again by it being in the sixth house, emphasized again, by a Virgo south node in the third. Now, um, when I first worked with her, it was a chart reading. And my eye, of course, went first here, <laughs> right? So to me, I think some of the first things I communicated to her was around these themes. This to me is the double signature, what I call a double signature of digestion, of introjection. Right, so we know that Scorpio rules the digestive system. We know that Virgo is also about digestion, assimilation, taking in. Um, they're both yin signs. This is retrograde, right? So Pluto is looking back into the sixth house, figuring something out even deeper about the sixth house. We see uh, Pluto as the point of a yod here. Um, we see it here um, in Gibbous phase to Mercury and. Venus, and I'm going to depart from the evolutionary astrology paradigm and say sun as well. Um, and then uh, we see it here in, um, in, in a full phase, uh, right? Uh, full phase in conjunct, sorry. <laughs> Gemini, Mars, first house. Okay. So, um, my first words to her that I remember were, your soul is working through um, all of these internalized messages, perspectives, mm -hmm. information that you have ingested, you have taken in, and even criticisms, right? Because we have to look at the balance of the chart. And here I'm looking at, you know, Virgo, of course, and its ruler here is part of this in conjunct in a gibbous in conjunct, which again gives it that Virgo flavor, right? <laughs> so 
So this is this is a soul that's wanting to throw off that, that's wanting to get to the bottom line of what is the truth. And there's another reason why I would say that is because of the North Node pointing up in the ninth house there. Something about getting back to the authentic self. Um, so let me just see, I have some notes on this. Another word I would give this particular in conjunct is purging. And it is the purging of those externalized messages so that perspective can be changed. It's also, if I include all of the planets in that interpretation, I'm looking at this as, as what, what is the intention of that Pluto at the apex of that yod is it's the ability to act and be acted upon by life events and allow oneself to be deeply transformed because of them or through those events, right? It also gives a, a, a representation, especially because when we look at Pluto Mars phase as also a bottom line to looking at the chart, this also gives a message about the, the interplay between personal will and divine will, right? And so here, this is this, and it's in Gemini. So it is about, again, messages, right? And Jeffrey always talked about this in conjunct as being the messages one gets from on high, right? And is one able to act on them, internalize them? Um, I would say here, again, I'm just synthesizing all of it and giving it words. Um, and I'll give an example later about this uh, it, it, personal will versus divine will and how sometimes it's played out in her life like that. Um, opening up to act on this guidance and feel worthy, right? This is a big complex for this person. Um, being able to, I mean, she's, Brazilian, okay, I don't, for those of you that don't know, you know, to be open to spirit, to talk to spirits, all of that's just a normal part of Brazilian culture. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not some big esoteric concept for Brazilians, for mo most of Brazilians, and she definitely comes from that kind of conditioning, right? So being open to the occult and the esoteric and spiritual is not alien to her. She was not brought up with a specific condition because, uh, you know, that's not putting aside that Brazil could be a very Roman Catholic country, but it also always has that kind of, you know, undertone to it of, you know, but we can talk to spirits too, <laughs> you know, it's not as punitive as the, uh, as the American version of Christianity. Um, so she has, you know, she's free of that kind of conditioning there. So, you know, I would say that this, this is about the power to mold, to be molded, right? It's about the digestion and then assimilation and then integration of all of that. Um, <clears throat> um, I also would put in, as I start to extend, well, there's another yod here too, right? Um, if I want to jump ahead and look at that, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> head cold. <laughs> um, if I want to jump ahead and look at this Mars yacht, um, we're going to see that Saturn and uh, Neptune are part of this, as is Pluto again. Um, so to me, again, if I'm going to kind of put this into condense it, you know, I might say that this is something about a reactive nature being tempered, right? Um, and, and I would say that there's other aspects of the chart that also back that up. The mutability of the node by house and sign mm -hmm. can have something to do with reacting, rolling with things rather than, you know, being directive. And so this is also going to cause that kind of internal compression and pressure. Yes, there's pressure there, there's, but pressure that gives that kind of um, ability to then digest experience rather than run through experience, um, to be able to digest it so that one is transformed by it. Again, Pluto's very active in these yards. Um, 
And again, the understanding of one's own bottom line mode is what makes one tick. Um, the love of wanting to know that about oneself and others is a part of this, this person's journey. Um, there's some music playing in the background. I don't know, it's, it's nice, but... <laughs> don't know what it is. Messages from on high, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um so the the i forgot where i was though yes power of one's communications and the power of other people's words but again back to the messages that have been taken in um other mars themes as we know mars at the apex here can have a lot to do with again the transformation of one's identity because we also have saturn and uh, Neptune in the eighth house, right? So what I see um, in this is also a wanting someone to wake up to one's own, so the spiritualization of one's identity and then waking up to one's power within that spirituality, one's authority within that spirituality. And I don't mean this in an egoic sense. This person has a natural sense of humility. So it isn't an inflation as much as it's a, a realization of, ah, this is something I can give to the world, right? Because this person has had a tendency to project that power onto others um, and not see it in themselves. So um, some of the other things about her life she, uh, when, when her, her sister was born when she was 11 and she could see her parents were middle class, not poverty, but, you know, always kind of just making enough to get by. And she said to herself, um, when she was 11, I don't want to be a burden to them. So I have to be self-sufficient. I have to make my own way. And some of this has to do with that Aries nature, um, and and the self-sacrificing nature of the Virgo and sixth house. And so she said from the time she was 11, she pretty much cut off the ability for somebody to take care of her. She cut off, put up a wall between her and her parents and the ability to take in um, anything that they would have wanted to give to her because she was kind of like, and this is an important thing because at this age, 11, 12, 13, she started you know, paying for her own school. She got jobs. She did all this, blah, 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 blah. Yet she had this grandfather in the family who always fed her these messages that you're lazy. And the interesting thing, and this is to point out a, 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 to point out a, a dynamic of that repetition compulsion I was talking about and the way that our karma can obsess us. And when I say that, I say that in the, the way the Brazilians use the word obsessors, we would say it's a compulsion, but Brazilians would talk about obsessors like spirits that can possess us and cause us obsession. And our complexes can do that as well because our complexes, um, believe it or not, Jung talked about it, are autonomous from our total psyche. This is why they run the show from, you know, behind the curtain. They're like the wizard behind the curtain. That when you finally open up the curtain, you find out he's not all great and powerful, but you have to open the curtain to get to the complex. Otherwise, the complex is underground running the show, right? Because it's unconscious. So in an in a, in a illustration of that, the one person she went to for help in the family with paying for education because she was going to music school, um, Pisces, she was going to music school, um, was her grandfather. And, and she, she was living with them, taking care of her grandmother because her grandmother was ill. So she went, she left home, went to go live with them at 11, 12, 13. And grandfather was very narcissistic. She describes him as kind of, always the troublemaker in the family, turning people against each other, always wanting the attention on himself. And he was jealous of her and her relationship with her granny, which was very close. 
And so he tried to drive wedges between them. But the one person that she's going to go to to ask for help is him. <laughs> this is the complex, right? This is the complex around that, this independence and interdependence, right? This, this I want my freedom. I want my, you know, ability versus limitation and self-imposed limitation, which is also part of the dynamics of a yacht. And Jeffrey's talked about that before, right? That the gibbous yacht is very much about this, um, these internalized kind of impositions, restrictions, and the um, the uh, full face yacht, you know, can uh, is in conjunct the side of that can be these external limitations, right? That push us back onto ourselves or cause us to self-reflect. So you could see these are strong dynamics just in the analysis of that Pluto, right? Just in looking at that Pluto and some of the things that I told you, you can already see these things. So then we can also see how deeply this Virgo part is internalized and introjected. That's a big word for this chart, introjection, taking in um, all of these different viewpoints and criticisms as if they are her own inner voices. Um, and that's what happens to all of us from past lives. We get, you know, we, we uh, get these things projected onto us, we internalize them, and then life after life, they become our own inner voices that we think are ours until we start to do in this chart that Virgo Pisces work of discernment, right? That's separating the wheat from the chaff. That Pluto retrograde is definitely saying that, right? It's saying, throw this off, separate the wheat from the chaff, what belongs to you, what doesn't. Use what, you know, use what is true to you, right? You know, what has the most value? What has the most meaning? What is the most useful, right? That's a higher octave of Virgo, right? To be able to put to, and, and Scorpio, to be able to put to use that which is useful in service. So um, she also says of herself that she always felt like a little piece of dirt, um, always wanting to run away. We can see these dynamics on the third ninth house. Um, piece of dirt is of course the uh, Virgo aspects. And um, there's been a lifelong craving for spiritual learning, which we can also see from the uh, squared nodes, Jupiter in the 12th, Pisces, um, ruler of Pisces uh, in uh, the eighth house. Okay. So when we are in the midst of a complex, we either underdo it or overdo it. So when we talk about that repetition compulsion, the nature of trauma causing us to unconsciously re be in these recreated dynamics of a like scenario. Um, I'll give you an example from a client that I worked with, how that plays out. Uh, I had a client years ago. I'd never, I was just one chart reading. It was a one-off chart reading somebody in Europe. I didn't know her. Um, and I looked at the chart and Lots of times when I look at a chart, I see stories, but I think that way because I've been doing regression for over 20 years. <laughs> so I think of, you know, these things come to me when I look at a chart. And so, and, and not all charts do that, right? Some charts I look at and they're not spilling out tons of stories. This particular chart spilled out a story to me when I was analyzing it or looking at it. And not this one, the example I'm talking about. And what I saw was a, 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 a young girl, really toddler, like two, um, maybe even younger, with a mother out in a cabin. The father had left. Uh, the mother was destitute, didn't know how she was going to survive, went into a deep depression, possibly some kind of psychosis, some kind of mental nervous breakdown, snap. Um, took the baby in a trance, right? In this kind of like a uh, trance of hopelessness, took the baby down into the river and drowned herself and the baby. Um, and I saw that in the chart. And so when I met with her in the consultation, 
you know, I started to talk to her about that and she started crying. And she said that happened in this lifetime. She said, but what happened in this lifetime was that my mother told her this story because she had no memory of it. She was just an infant and her mother was depressive and had some kind of uh, mental disorders and um, tried to kill herself. This time, she didn't try to take the infant with her. She put the baby outside the door and went inside and put her head in the gas stove. And as the mother told her the story, as she was older, she said that the baby, her, was crying and kicking up a fuss so much outside that it snapped the mother out of it. Um, and she went out and took the baby and then I guess got the help that she needed um, because they, you know, she grew up and she hadn't killed herself or the child. So for the client, of course, that was a huge understanding of the dynamics between them and the grace of the universe, right? That repeated that pattern, but gave them the opportunity to heal it. So this is how our karma works. We are repeating these things that the letter keep pointing out, right? We are, and, and oftentimes, sometimes they're literal, but they're often a higher turn of the spiral. So I look at this evolution as a spiral, right? We keep revisiting the same themes, and I'm sure you could all identify this in your life. We keep, but so they get more and more subtle as we open the door to them and we heal them and resolve them and we integrate them and we change and then we go a higher turn of the spiral. And so that's, a, that's an illustration of that. Okay, you know, before I get into her story, let me just stop and see if there's any questions. And I need a time check because I have no clock in here and I need to get through a bunch of stories here with this chart. We're at 38 minutes. Whoa, meaning I have 38 left or? um 10 officially and then 15 for q a so 25 26 left but you're the last person so we can add a little more but please do because damn i got a lot of stories to get through well we'll try to you know <laughs> okay i'll check go back in, in a little bit okay so any questions before i plot on no let me just see what's in the chat uh, what part of Yod makes it gibbous? That is the, um, when you figure a phasal relationship. Oops, I went to the wrong foot. Hold on, let me go back. I'm not doing it. Lost the chart. Let's go here. Back. When you, um, when you do a phasal relationship, you go counterclockwise from the slower moving planet. Pluto here goes here. This is gibbous. The first in conjunct is gibbous going clockwise here. The second in conjunct is full phase, right? Same over here. If I'm gonna put Mars at the apex, these are the slower moving planets. I'm going counterclockwise, gibbous, um, and then uh, from Pluto, full phase, right? Okay, so, um, one of her regressions, so part of her theme has been, a repeating theme has been this feeling like a piece of dirt, feeling less than, and um, being one of those below deck Mediterranean yacht girls, cleaning rooms a lot. <laughs> she said like, I'm cleaning toilets. <laughs> and so, you know, and also being from another culture often gets treated less than, right? So this is, so you can imagine looking at Pluto in uh, Scorpio in the sixth house and the south node in Virgo that there's gonna be servant lives in there. Lives of servitude, lives of entrapment, lives of enslavement, lives of limitations, of no choice. Pluto, Scorpio, a lot about choices. So here she is, she's a servant girl. So she has one of those lives um, where she's an orphan and she's, uh, a servant. Um, this one was triggered by a mother-in-law in this lifetime that treated her kind of less than. Um, she gets abused by, I'm sorry, looking at notes, 
uh, she was left with nuns, um, and in her at Virgo Pisces, and in her um, in her stories, actually going to the convent is a good place for her. Unlike some uh, lots of other regressions, where it ends up not being other clients ends up not being so good. But for her, she's done this a couple times in different lifetimes, where she was kind of orphaned and left at a convent, and the nuns have, you know, been strict but pretty good to her. So. <clears throat> She uh, works on this farm. She gets abused by the husband. Um, she gets pregnant. She has the baby alone. Um, she's afraid that the woman of the house, who's very strict, is going to find out. Uh, she does. Farm workers hold her back. The woman takes the baby, um, ends up throwing in a rage, throws the baby in a well, and then drowns. The farm workers take her and drown her in a pond. Uh, so anyway, I'm not going to get into the details because I have a longer story about that that I want to share with you that kind of finally broke the trance of this servitude. But you can see from that lifetime that this is this is deeply ingrained in the soul, right? There's I'm I'm a left man. I deserve to be and and then killed because I'm a less than this. Um, Again, when we look at a uh, when we look at a square to the nodes, the first way when I'm looking at the nodes, I'm going to look at them both as a south node, and that's just a basic consideration. When they're squared, right? I'm going to look at them both as a south node first, and then as a north node second. So we're going to say we know she's been flip flopping between these Pisces ninth house kinds of stories with the moon conjunct, right? So we have here this this loss of the baby, and then the Virgo. Um, and of course, the rulers give us more information about that. So these next two stories I'm going to tell you, it actually illustrate this kind of flip-flop between the Virgo and the Pisces, so you can see it. In one of them, and this is the Pisces kind of side of it, she was this young farm girl in the French countryside, Nothing particularly dynamic about the family, just loving, living a simple life, doing their farm thing, kind of loving family. Um, they went to church, but they weren't Christian. They were kind of pretending to be Christian so that they didn't draw um, suspicions. They had, as a young girl, she could recall we had our own way of doing things. She didn't quite know what it meant, but in essence, they were they were basically Cathars. Um, and so uh, the Cathars, if you go through history, they were persecuted in France um, many times and in mass quite frequently. So anyway, she didn't know any of that. But at one point, she comes uh, into possession of this little book. She's about six or seven. And it's this little book that has pictures and drawings in it. And it's all about this Cathar faith, which has a lot to do with divine feminine. She doesn't read yet, or even um, if she's going to in that life, um, but she's obsessed with the pictures. And when, she, when this book is given to her, she's told, keep it secret, don't show anybody. So she would go to the barn by herself and just look at the pictures. And there was this picture of the dove, and she could describe the intricate drawings of this dove and the feeling that she would get, she'd go into like this kind of spiritual samadhi with this, just being this little six, seven year old with this, with this dove. And, and she would daydream about the dove and she would want, now think again, right? Pisces in the ninth house, she would want to fly away with the dove. And, you know, she was just obsessed with this dove. <clears throat> Around 12 or 13, um, she, in that lifetime, she got raped by a neighbor. And the surrounding people knew about it and they blamed her. This is, of course, very Virgo interjection. I'm bad. I'm dirty. I did something wrong, blaming the victim we know. Um, and she, she said, or she recounts at that point is when she lost her innocence like this joy and this elation that she would feel. Um, she was not really able to access that, yet she was still obsessed with this dove. And, it, and, and so that natural spirituality became a dissociative response. 
And in, in essence, this one story illustrates these two layers or the, these different layers or different parts of the spectrum of the Pisces archetype, right? One can be dissociative response to trauma. It's not a pejorative, it's a natural function of the psyche, it's a defense. Um, and, and or uh, spiritual um, experience. So anyway, one day she comes back to the barn. She's, I don't know, around 15 something. And she everything's scattered around and torn apart and the little book is in pieces and things like that. And these guards come and they take the family away and she ends up getting hung. Uh, and then her little spirit stayed in the tree, kind of at the top of the tree stuck there when she got to the Bardo, I'm looking at my notes, my client knows, when she got to the Bardo, she met the divine feminine, which um, <clears throat> was, was uh, and I'm, I'm really short shortening this because I have some other things I want to illustrate about this chart. Um, she meets the divine feminine, who then is, um, <clears throat> you know, giving her a lot of healing, um, encouraging her that she's going to learn to read and write and the bardo there in the spirit world that all of this is possible and that when she got to the higher bardos to figure out why was this life what was the meaning of that life she she um, had the download or the understanding that that life was about the beginning of the installation instilling passion for freedom and wisdom and learning in spirit right so that this, you know, even through this hardship that and the trauma of that, that this desire for, um, I would say, transcendence or spirituality was instilled upon her. Um, okay, let me see. She also said that the part of the complex behind this that had played out in her life that was um, alleviated from this and shown to her very clearly after that regression what the complex was even more was that in this lifetime, when she would go to seek learning, um, <clears throat> it would be dangerous. Something would come up and try to block it, right? Just like grandfather saying, no, I'm not gonna give you the money. Um, but, but there was this deep fear, anxiety that going for learning, going for what, really is my soul's desire, really is my soul's authentic self is going to kill me and my whole family, right? So we can see that here in the Virgo Pisces, third, ninth house. <clears throat> now in another life on the, where am I here? On the, oh, the Virgo side of that was of course the servant life that I was talking about, right? So we can see the flip-flopping. The Mars where the node shows up um, in some of her lives as life cut short, inability to live one's potentials, right? Net, like dying young, it can be a Mars kind of complex, um, you know, not being able to complete one's education, one's learning, never being able to fulfill potential. So that shows up. Also can be, vi you know, violence can be life cut short like that. Um, in one of these, she was the kind of Tibetan Mongolian man, not necessarily life cut short, but invasion, which is a more theme. And um, as part of the Chinese invasion of Tibet, it was around that time, the family was killed and he had been whatever out doing his shepherding thing, traveling, I think he was some kind of merchant. And, and he came back and the village was burned down and the family was killed and he was deeply distraught and grieved by this because his daughter had just gotten married and he was um, just distraught that she's never going to get to live her life. And he, he goes into hiding because he had to, because the invaders were still around. And he kind of goes into dehydration and kinds of hallucinations, et cetera, and dies, um, actually ended up stabbing himself with something sharp to kill himself um, as he was kind of hiding in this cave. And it's interesting when he went into the Bardo, this wrathful deity came to him as a guide, uh, which is not uncommon in Tibetan beliefs. 
and basically said to him, this is, you know, how karma works because he was angry at the Chinese and he was the, the wrathful deity was saying it's it's not about race. Stop clinging to the differences. Um, stop clinging to your anger. You have to focus on getting rid of the chains of karma, which I thought was really interesting in that. And I'm, again, I'm bullet pointing. There was a lot more work that happened there. It was just bullet pointing. Um, this is not the kind of message that an immature soul gets, right? <laughs> so I'm only pointing out that, you know, somebody pointing, and this also has a lot to do with this um, new phase Saturn conjunct uh, Neptune, which is square to the ruler of the node there, and this also being the ruler of the North Node, um, you know, has a lot to do with the realization of heart, um, taking the, and when we say taking responsibility, taking the responsibility, but understanding that we are part of this co-creation, right? And that we have power. <laughs> We have power within this if we do in this eighth house, if we do the deep dive, uh, which she is doing, Pluto and Scorpio as well, right? Um, what was interesting is she said that she had hepatitis and had, had this uh, pain in that part where um, the, the uh, uh, Mongolian stabbed himself. And after this regression, that part went away, that pain that was residual from hepatitis was in the liver, went away. Um, there's also been past life themes of entrapment, of these feelings of no way out. And some of these are deeply psychological as we can expect, again, with the nature of the odds. Um, external, uh, external limitations that become internal limitations over lifetimes. Uh, sometimes in one life, sometimes the extraction of many lifetimes that then become these self-imposed limitations. I see that a lot with Saturn when it's involved in the nodal axis, Saturn Capricorn involved in the karmic um, in the karmic axis in any way. So in another lifetime, she was this Victorian boy born to a kind of single mom uh, or didn't know where the father was, kind of cold mother, you know, always telling him, you can't cry. You have to be proper. You have to do your duty. You know, these are all very Virgo, Capricorn kind of Saturn messages, um, blah, blah, blah. And um, told him he had to grow up and go to medical school and be a doctor. Um, didn't want to be, but ended up doing that. Went into the military as a surgeon's assistant on a ship. Kind of hated it. Um, <laughs> was disgusted by the war, was an even self-described mediocre doctor, <laughs> right? Now we know the Virgo Pisces act is associated with healing. Um, so uh, he, <clears throat> he leaves the military and goes to be a doctor in the city. Uh, he's very alone, doesn't have any relationships, suspects he's gay, um, this is the client suspecting that she was he was gay in that life, but never expressed it. And the one time that he kind of cuts loose and goes to some ritzy, gets invited to some kind of political ritzy party at some uh, you know big fancy house, he got tipsy and going home, he gets mugged and killed and um, dies alone and dies feeling like a fraud. This is also a very Saturn kind of complex, right? It also, to me, Saturn can feel, you know, a lot of self-recrimination, especially again at death, right? This, you know, I was a fraud. I was, and, and all of his life, he judged judgment, judged himself as the mediocre doctor, you know, doing this thing that never really liked to do. So, Further complex here relates to not only Virgo Pisces, but third and ninth house. Um, you know, to me, he was living a double life, right? If we look at the North Node in the ninth house, especially in Pisces there, it's really pointing to this get to your truth, get to your authentic self. And this, this is a wounding to the authentic self. Again, that potentiality cut short, having to live third house, a double life, being a doctor, not wanting to be a doctor, 
being gay, not being able to express that, not ever seeking love. Again, Saturn is square, Venus, Mercury, ruler of the South Node. So there's those kinds of limitations. Um, we went into the bardo, the afterlife, and the patients came um, and told him, you know, you did kind of help us even if you didn't save our lives. We appreciated you, so on and so forth. These were the spirits from that life helped him a little bit to move on. But eventually in the Bardo and the spirit world, these indigenous healers came and um, dark skin, she described them as beautiful kind of dark skin. And they, they were helping uh, this doctor part of the self to realize that part of what that life was about was actually um, learning about the failure of Western medicine and how it's not aligned with natural healing, ninth house, natural law, right? Virgo Pisces, healer actus, um, and telling him that you are one of us. This was part of your learning, learning about the failure of those systems so that you could come back to yourself as a healer. Um, and, and then had all of these uh, kinds of experiences in the Bardo about feeling the oneness of himself, herself, uh, with nature, right? This is this unbinding, I'm not using my words, but unwinding this complex. And, and, and I can say that Virgo, being a Pluto Virgo in the sixth house myself, we are the most neurotic people, right? <laughs> you know, we're just ridden with neurosis, right? And the, the Victorian doctor, is like a classic Virgo kind of caricature archetype of that, just kind of ridden with this, um, you know, kind of neurosis and self-criticism and so on and so forth that then, you know, stops this kind of expression. And when he was able to be freed in the afterlife through these encounter with the indigenous people who then opened him to his true nature, right? This Pisces in the ninth house. So you can see the dynamics of, again, what I love about uh, doing regression with people is when we can get into the complex and unwind it, unravel it. I think of it a lot like Ariadne and her thread, right? Follow the thread into the core of the complex where it's bound and it's hidden by defenses um, and very hard to get to just through the conscious mind alone which is why talk therapy rarely works to unwind these complexes. Um, when we can go and meet the soul on its own level, subconscious to subconscious, we can open that complex. And when we can open the complex, we can then offer the complex um, solutions, resolutions, healing, right? So that then what happens is that the natural the natural potentiality that's been bound in the complex is released. And that's what we see here when I said that this uptight Victorian doctor becomes this indigenous healer, right? And of course, for her, this is the realization of the parts of her that have been unable to live herself authentically, what she's been hiding about herself and her own potentiality. Um, Okay, where am I on time? We are at one hour, and I've been consulting with the admin, and it's a small group, and it's our last talk, so I'm gonna follow my intuition and support you to just engage more in this space, because I think many of us will appreciate that. Let's add to start just another 15 minutes. If you can keep it, within that, so that's another 30 minutes. Okay. We can try to aim to keep this within 30 minutes. Um, that's ideal, but let's let's okay. let's hold that container. Um, All right. If you wanna create brief for Q and A, maybe consider that as well. I will. Um, so I'm gonna share two more stories, one um, more bullet pointed and the other more detailed, which will really show the dynamics of these kinds of complexes. So um, the other one really brings out some of the Venusian themes in the chart, because you might be wondering where they were. Um, <laughs> and we may not, you know, immediately connect that, but we do have this very strong 
uh, square Venus, and then we have Venus, you know, I don't know if anybody would consider this Kavini, but it's definitely combust. Um, the sun, I think technically this is not Kazini, but you know, we could, whatever, we could argue about that. But then we also have Mercury as part of this. So this, and, and this is, she is a very strong Venusian person, a beautiful Brazilian woman, right? But in a natural beauty way, not in the kind of plastic surgery Brazilian kind of cultural way. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of Virgonian uh, natural. So, so there is that magnetism there, right? And then there's these, these squares to that. So you can imagine that there's been experiences in past lives and also part of this in conjunct here. You can imagine that there's been experiences in past lives where that um, has not been, um, you know, worked in her favor and maybe parts of oneself that one has shut down because of that, right? So, um, and needs to reclaim because of that. So in one, she um, was a woman just working in a market, selling flowers, whatever, in the village square, meets an aristocratic man, and there's this magnetic attraction. This is the kind of Pluto uh, Venus thing, also the square from the eighth house. Um, and so they meet secretly in different places around town and it's just lust, but on the first side of it, it's not a, it's not a physical lust, it's the magnetism, like, <laughs> like people that have, you know, I have Venus and Scorpio in the eighth house, right? There's a certain, I can attest to this kind of energy that it's like, when you have a karma with somebody or a connection with it, there's a kind of magnetism there. So this is what this woman in the past life was experiencing, this magnetism with this aristocratic man, they secretly met and just, you know, had sex in all these different little places. And then, but he was married. And unfortunately, this is sometimes the Venusian complex being the other woman, right? Being, because it has a lot to do, unfortunately, with one's self-value and where one has been devalued, right? Because of one's Venusian qualities. Um, and so she, she sees him one day leaving on the ship with his family and she's kind of devastated and can't go on. And this was the person that she knew in this lifetime. And this the reason why she got to that past life is because she wanted to explore this mystery man that she had known in this lifetime that she had an affair with, a kind of repeated affair while she was in another relationship. And she said it was just this magnetic and I was like, I don't know what how that happened right <laughs> and wanted to explore what was that karma so that was one story that came up around it and the other one um when when uh it, this was at a workshop and i had come over and directed her to go back to when that trance with this aristocratic person began and bang she went back to this other lifetime again where she was kind of young naive woman meets this man of power. He's this uh, kind of, again, aristocratic or some, excuse me, position of power or wealth. And um, they would they go to his place. He's kind of like a, you know, I was going to say not a Caligula figure, but a kind of like a Hugh Hefner kind of figure, right? Have these massive orgies and drugs and everybody would be drugged and she would be drugged and kind of held in the spell and trance of this man um, and just piles of bodies, disgusted internally about it, but driven by this kind of compulsion, like he had some kind of spell on her, Spengali-ish. This is very Scorpio. Um, and she ended up dying kind of in this pile of bodies during this orgy. I suspect it was some kind of asphyxiation or something from the drugged um, and suffocation, et cetera. Um, she had said that months earlier before that session, I mean, this made a lot of sense to her because months earlier before that session, he was getting woken up with these really strong pornographic dreams, which she said is not normal for her or of her nature. And it kind of shocked her. And when I worked with her in the end of that session, 
um, it became clear, and again, back to the Brazilian culture, that this man had an obsessor spirit around him that had then, um, this is very Scorpio, <laughs> he had interjected, right, through, again, dissociation, drugs, right, loss of oneself, and when you lose yourself, something else uh, quite frequently can possess you. Nature abhors a vacuum, right? So she had this kind of dark obsessor spirit that had entered her through these sexual drug practices. And we had to um, excise that spirit, which happened um, happily. And um, she was quite clear after that. So, <laughs> okay, so that's just to give you a, a little darker side of Scorpio there um, and show you some of those kinds of Venusian uh, complexes, of course. Now, this last one is another servant life, but I'm going to give this one to you more in detail because it brings in a lot of different aspects of the chart. And it was a most recent life that um, I actually did with her just a couple of weeks ago. And she is back, she's still working on the boats and she's working on a private yacht this time. And the people on this yacht are really not nice people. They talk down to her, she's the Brazilian maid. They do, they kind of echo the grandfather's voice. Lazy, stupid girl, blah, blah, blah. And she's uh, of course, stuck in a contract um, and she and her husband both do this work together. Um, and they're the only two on the boat working with this uh, hoity couple. Uh, and so you could imagine one feels trapped right? <laughs> doing that. It's not the end of her contract, but still she called me asking for a session. So we worked with it um, and she went back to a life this is very much like the other servant life I told you. She went back to a life where she's this little baby in a cot, but just stiff and terrified, like full of anxiety, just as the baby. And as we come to realize this, this baby is orphaned um, and left kind of with this family that's not her own family. She's a she in the past life. So I can use those pronouns. So this little she baby is left with this family with other boys and there's no real love there. And even as a baby feels that and just defended and terrified. Um, totally kind of dissociated again. This is very Pisces confused. I don't know why I'm here. Um, totally overlooked. Neglected. Neglect is also a part of the Virgo and the Saturn Capricorn coldness, as we know, is also can be part of Virgo, definitely part of Capricorn. Um, <laughs> this, you know, meeting with this coldness. And so the boys, as she grows up there in this family that's not her family, the, they're all cold to her. The boys pick on her. She feels scared and hungry all the time. She has to go take care of the chickens and she hates, she's a little girl, four or five years old, hates taking care of the chickens because they peck at her and she's got little scars all over. And just when whenever she can and not having to do chores, she just hides. This is the Pisces complex, as well as can be a Virgo complex, right? Um, not wanting to be seen. Uh, and so sometimes in past lives, it's literal. Um, she gets told, you know, just shut up and do your chores. You should be grateful for being here. You know, all of these messages, again, the interjection of these messages at such a tiny, young, fragile age. You can imagine how the souls carry that um, through lifetimes. And again, that it becomes this lifetime, um, this lifetime, her own inner voices. So at one point they decide she's totally useless. They don't want to feed her anymore and they take her away. And the sad part of it is this little girl, that's all she knows, she's crying. She doesn't want to go away, right? This is what we do with our security, right? This is, this is all I know, right? And the unknown is scarier, right? So she's crying, she doesn't want to go away. They send her away and they bring her to the nunnery, her second time in the nunnery. 
And the nuns are first kind of like, all right, we hear your trouble. We got our eyes on you. But as she grows up there, because she's only about seven or eight when they take her there, as she grows up there, she learns or she finds herself loving the prayers and the peace there and even the routine, right? This would be very Virgo, right? <laughs> right? The routine of that and the Virgo Pisces, she finds a lot of solace in the Virgin Mary um, and sees her as her own divine mother. So now it's about 12 or 13 and it's that time, I guess, at the nunnery when the girls are sent, like you're old enough now, you're an adult, now you need to go out and get jobs. And they send them to be servants in houses. Um, and she, of course, doesn't want to go. And it's very heartbreaking. There is, of course, as we know, bottom line of these Pluto kinds of complexes, loss, betrayal, abandonment, right? Those are the three classic words that Jeffrey always talked about. You want a complex, loss, betrayal, abandonment, just go there. Pluto, Scorpio, Pluto in the eighth house, Scorpio, south node. Um, you know, in any of those, any of those, you'll find that. So, you know, there is some of that for her, uh, definitely that for her, abandonment for sure, loss for sure, and a feeling of betrayal. But she has no choice. So she goes, um, she gets to this new house. She's pretty grateful. They they give her new, so the, the cook meets her and she's going to be the one that, you know, tells her what to do. But they they put her in this little room, you know, little dark room, but they clean her up and they give her some new clothes. And she's grateful for these new clothes because they're like clean and crisp and so on and so forth. Um, basically, it's a servant life. You know, she she works in the kitchen. She's the first one to get up. You know, she's like the scullery maid at whatever age she is, 12 or 13. Remember, I told you before, keep an eye on those ages because that was this lifetime when at 11, 12, 13, she said, that's it. I'm going to take care of myself. And no, I, nobody's like, I don't deserve anybody to take care of me and so on and so forth. This has been a repeated pattern um, in, in a few lives, this one and also. Um, so here she is. She's got to be the first one to get up, get the wood, warm the water, you know, make sure the fire's ready, et cetera, et cetera, and not be seen. This is an important message. Well, she's already good at that, so that's okay. You know, he's scrubbing the floor, you don't look up, and all of those things. She doesn't want to be seen, and in fact, as the character, as herself in the past life, saying, I just, I just want to be invisible. I don't even want anybody to see me. I'm so horrible and ugly, and because they had been telling her that, when she was at the other house with all the little scars and skinny and you're just ugly and ugh, useless. So again, internalized, inject, interjected all of that. Um, she does see the other kids, the, the, the families, the, the owners, the uh, kids. And of course that only makes her feel bad, worse about herself because they're all clean and educated and running around and having fun. And she's not allowed to do any of that. Um, and she gets some reprieve. They have a family dog, which is St. Bernard, and she's allowed, or her chore is to take him out into the courtyard and let him do his business and then clean up after him. But she finds comfort from the St. Bernard because he's just this big St. Bernard. <laughs> and, you know, she kind of forms a relationship with that. She, she also, and you might be wondering sometimes, where is all the Mars in these things? Well, deeply, she is angry. She is an angry little girl, and rightfully so, right? And so this anger, this seething anger that's been under the layers of depression and repressed kind of starts to come out, and, and a little bit of her own will starts to come out, and she wants to run away. Third, ninth house, right? She wants to be moving on move, Gemini. And, um, but she needs a plan and she has no knowledge of the outside world, but she knows that wealth means something. So she figures she needs a little wealth to get by in the outside world. And she, as she's cleaning the silver over several weeks, she keeps stashing away a few pieces of the silver from the kitchen and she gets caught. Um, and these men in boots come and take her away and they, um, put her in a cell, they beat her, 
Um, and in the process of beat her, I don't think they intended to kill her, but they did. Uh, and some blow to the head, which again would be very Mars in the first house. Um, ruling Aries, Mars rules the head. Um, she died crying, devastated actually, crushed and feeling very angry. Again, rightfully so. And she went into the dark and she kept saying, it, it's not worth to live, I'm never going back there. This is spirit of this young girl now, young woman. I'm gonna stay hiding and it's not safe. It's not safe to go there. Now, another thing I often say about Pluto Scorpios or people with strong Scorpio signatures and their karmic axis is that I could put them on the map and just have them say, it's not safe, nowhere is safe. And bang, there'll be a story there. <laughs> Because that is the bottom line Scorpio consciousness, right? Nowhere is safe. And her combination of that, her translation of that with the Virgo Pisces access is I just want to hide. I'm just going to roll up into myself, right? Um, and so, you know, she, this soul, this part of her soul, this young woman part of her soul stayed in that dark place, which she does in several other lifetimes as well feeling like dirt, feeling horrible, feeling just, you know. So little by little, I'm strategizing with how to get her out of the dark place because in my work, doing the regression is only part of it. 50% of the work has to happen in the afterlife because what we're actually dealing with are the condensed complexes and they need to be reworked because that's how you heal the soul. So now, you know, I need a strategy. So I had said to her, um, you know, there was one being down there that loved you and protected you and wanted to be with you. And it was St. Bernard, not the St. Bernard, <laughs> the fluffy St. Bernard. And so I asked the spirit of the dog to come and little by little, she could warm up to that. Um, and you know, she felt the warmth and the licking and so on and so forth. But she kept saying, I can't trust this. Think of a really deep Scorpio complex, right? Somebody who's been so betrayed, so abandoned, so lost. Um, and so it was hard for her to trust. Uh, but little by little, with encouragement and dog's help, I got her to out of the dark place to what I would call, what we call in my work, the intermediary bardo, which is a healing place, right? So it, it, theoretically that part of her soul was still earthbound. Now we need to get out of the earthbound plane into the intermediary bardo so that healing can start to happen. We can now call upon help um, because it's not stuck in that earthbound plane. So she goes there and she's kind of saying, I'm just dried up, I'm a twig. And then crying because the feeling is there, even though it's a lovely, bright, shiny place, they're not going to let me stay here. They're going to take me away again. I'm going to lose it all, right? This is a very deep complex. Um, so, and of course, the realization here is, and this is part of what the meaning is of these nodes, the North Node in Pisces in the ninth house, the regaining of cosmic trust right? The rectification of oneself to the divine grace, right? Again, a higher octave of Jupiter in the 10th house, I, I'm sorry, in the 12th house, right? Would be that re reception of the grace that's available to all of us, uh, but we often don't, you know, remember it or know it. Um, and so this is, and, and the polarity point to Pluto is what? Taurus in the 12th house, Simple trust, right? Turn down the volume, let it be simple. Rejuvenate the body, feel the embodiment, feel spiritual embodiment. And this is exactly what happened in the Bardo. So she feels like a dried up twig, no life, et cetera, et cetera. So it's clear that what needs to happen little by little is the allowing this part of the soul to regain trust and open to resources that it has not been able to open before. So I, I reminded her of the comfort of prayer she had when she was a little girl at the nunnery. 
like remember that spirit, the, the comfort of that prayer. And so she starts to remember that. And as she's doing that, what was interesting, and she's describing this to me, these little ant beings are coming, but they're like little ants of light. And they're like little, Chris, she's describing them like little, and they're coming. And she says, they're coming. She's whispering, they're coming. They're very small, so as not to scare me. Like, again, little humble ants, such a Virgo image, right? <laughs> little ants coming. And as she notices, they're coming in streams. And she looks up, and it's the Virgin Mary with her hands out like this. And the ants are coming out of her palms on these light beams. And it's like this, and she's up there and she's sending this energy to her. And it takes a while. So we work a lot with this beautiful energy that's offered to us from um, the higher being. Um, and, and she takes the, she said they're tingling like diamonds all over my body and slowly they're rebuilding the bone and the sinew and the muscle and the, you know, again, we're in the spirit world, but this is the spirit body that's being rebuilt. She'd been so dehydrated, deflated, you know, <laughs> right? Just spiritually stuck dry, basically. And so, um, and, and, and I asked her as this work is happening, what is Virgin Mary communicating to you? What, what is the energy, the messages that's coming? And, and she, Virgin Mary said to her, you are worthy and that's why I'm here. And they have this dialogue and she still is, are you sure? I can't believe it, I hear you, but I don't believe it. But as her body is starting to rebuild and she's feeling left out more, more energetic, she starts to become aware of this, just again, the polarity point to Pluto, this Taurus, the rebuilding of the etheric body, um, feeling stronger. Um, and so then in the, in the, in the afterlife in the Bardo there, it, this is interesting too. I thought, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I've been doing this work 20 something years and I just find every, every regression fascinating because it's just the peek into the, the workings of the psyche and then also working with the, um, afterlife beings I learn every time. Um, and so, uh, she said, I'm, I'm becoming a mountain. And I realized in my mind, um, you know, in the Tibetan tradition that she practices, which is an esoteric form of Tibetan, probably closest to the bone tradition, there's a thing called elemental soul retrieval in that. And, and your, in their traditions, your ancestors can be mountains, streams, whatever, and they call it elemental soul retrieval, that you need to retrieve the element that is the essence of your soul and your ancestry to be whole. And as she said, I'm becoming a mountain. I, I mean, I never even talked with her about it afterwards, but I'm pretty sure this was a soul memory of that particular Tibetan practice where she was recovering that part of her soul. Um, and then, then out of the mountain come these beings that were like ants, see, this is why I'm making that connection, like ancestors, but their ancestors, thousands of them, she said, that were those that had been enslaved, but knew how to be free or learned how to be free, right? So all these souls in the afterlife that had been through similar things to what she was through many lifetimes and they're coming. And there, and then now I want you to also notice here that the, the, the Uranus part of this, right? The Uranus part of this liberating energy, um, part of that square. Um, and that, that she, she now, um, these beings are coming and they're coming with this warmth in their heart. And they're saying, we were enslaved, but we're free. And they're sharing this um, how to be free just with heart energy, not with words. And she's saying there's this radiance coming through their hearts to her heart. And she said, I'm quoting her words. It's like we share one big heart together. 
And then she said to them, are you sure it's over? And they were like, yes, you, you have to let it go. It's over. And so then I asked for the mother from that life to come that she never knew, spirit of that mother. And this young woman comes, spirit, radiant, happy to see her, explain to her. So just in brief, I'll tell you it was a longer process, but in brief, this the woman mother explained to her that she um, was violated by a farmhand and that's how she conceived her as a child and that she was also very depleted and not had the energy and that she died in childbirth, which is why she ended up being an orphan, but she had wanted her very much. Um, and so there was this realization of the likeness of both of them um, but what she also thought that what's really interesting, she didn't realize this about herself during her lifetime. When she looked at mother, mother was dark skinned and indigenous. And I think she didn't realize that she was different like that in that lifetime, right? <laughs> and that it kind of occurred to her, but she was seeing this be the beauty of this indigenous nature again. Um, at time talking about how she's just tiny and dark skinned and just beautiful. And she and mother come to the, you know, this place of this, um, you know, you made this sacrifice for me. Again, look at Virgo Pisces and the moon in Pisces. She said, you gave your breath to give me breath and kind of, you know, bowed to mother, even though it was a hard life, but just the, the just the, he was overcome with the, um, with the principle of that sacrifice, right? And both of them just kind of um, stayed in that um, realization. So now these free beings are kind of around her and mother, and I encourage them to now start to release the chains. And I'm like, you know, they may not be physical chains. And she goes, yes, yes, chains around our hearts. And so they're getting the chains and then all of a sudden, it's like it's rippling through the ancestral line. And she starts to see present life ancestors. Again, she's Brazilian, I didn't know this. She told me later that she's also part of her family was Colombian or is Colombian. And I guess Colombians are persecuted somewhat in Brazil. And so they've had this whole thing in her ancestral line about poverty and being less than and being put down whatever because of the color of your skin and I know that is the thing in Brazil the darker skinned people are just like they are in other countries as Americas as well right oppressed and not given opportunities and so on so it was like this collective shame in the ancestral line and these, uh, these beings are helping to lift it all, right? And and she's just like vibrating in this waves of power. <laughs> just like, it's like there's a wave of energy. Now, right now we're in this really empowered Pisces place, right? You can just, and the Jupiter just flow with that, those waves of energy. Um, and she's saying it makes sense now and it really is over. And she said, and it's over for that. Because it's over for them, it's over for me. And what she came to realize, she told me later, was that she said, yeah, I know I had this Virgo complex, but I didn't realize I was burdened by the ancestral chains as well, right? And to me, I often see people with Saturn-Pluto contacts or archetypal-like complex contacts here we have Saturn in the eighth house in Capricorn that carry ancestral burdens and either they know it or they don't she knew it or she, I mean she didn't know it but then it made sense to her later because she was like you know I've always had this drive about changing something in the family line even though I didn't know what it was and I didn't know how long I'd been or even what I was carrying right so this became apparent through this and then that was kind of what finally freed her not only her personal complex and this is a big long discussion I can talk about how our core karmas are reflected into the societies we're born into into the families we're born into and into the ancestry we're born into and into the societies we're born into and into the cultures we're born into it's all one big like 
uh, kind of stream of energy. So as we work on our core complexes, we then move out into the ancestral field and work on the ancestral complexes, which are similar to our own core complex, out to the societal, the culture, blah, blah. It goes on and on. Um, but the most important ones to us, the ones that are closest and most personal to us, are quite frequently the, um, the core complexes and the ancestral complexes. They're very like. And, and, and I know Jeffrey's also talked about this uh, Scorpio, right? DNA, right? This is also ancestral memory. So we have this Pluto and Scorpio in the service to the ancestors there. Uh, so, and this is again, moving from, to me, the, the prescription is always move from the wounded to the higher octave or a higher octave of that archetype to start to release the, what I call the libidinal energy. And by libidinal, I'm not talking eros. I am talking eros, but I'm talking pure life force that gets bound in these complexes, right? And when you start to open them up and unravel them and heal them, this pure libidinal potential is restored to the soul, to the soul itself, not just the individual person, the soul itself, right? Which then can give the ego self the ability to rise to the soul's potential where it hasn't been before. So we re-meet the spirits of the people from that house after all this liberation's happening. And, you know, I tell her, tell them, take your fucking spoons back. And so, you know, she does, and she's like, but, you know, but actually she's filled with a lot of compassion because she's seeing them and she's saying, she's like holding these silver spoons and the silver and saying, this means nothing. This is not what you're looking for, right? And she's like saying, like really having compassion for them, Pisces, you know, and saying, you don't see how you're imprisoned. I thought I was imprisoned. But I think you are chained. Your hearts are chained even more. Um, and the other beings are affirming this, saying, you need to realize how imprisoned you've been. They're saying to the spirits of these people. And then, um, you know, and then the spirits tell her, it's going to take them a while to realize that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking, oh, consensus state spirits. <laughs> they still have several lives to get there, but it's okay. They'll get there eventually. So they go off into the spirit world with prayer. She's sending them prayers saying, I pray for you, not in a condescending way, in an actual general, genuine expression of compassion that says, I pray for you so that you will see the cage that you're in, right? You know, praying for your liberation. Um, and then they re-meet the nuns and the other children. And I said, the children from the orphanage, and that was all good, because um, she said she was worried about them. Um, and then I said, the, I looked around, or with her in my mind's eye, looked around at these liberating spirits, and I said, are these enslaved, now free spirits? And I said, let's call them liberators. And I said, you're one of them too, right? And then now, again, look at this nice little Saturn, Neptune, Uranus thing we have going on there, right? Um, and so she was like, yes, I am. And so she's starting to, again, feel this kind of power that um, can come from her own liberation and how it can help others uh, feel free. So again, she grows up in the spirit world. She starts to become this kind of old wise woman. It's like she starts morphing into her potential spirit being, her potential spirit self, which is an indigenous dark skinned old wise woman. And she's saying, I have so much love to give, so much wisdom to give. Again, we're so in the North Node right now and the polar <laughs> points. Um, and like I said, you don't even have to sit. It's like the soul just goes there, right? It's so amazing to me how the, the how the chart is such a map of this process, this natural process of healing that happens when you unwind the complex, and it just slingshots um, to the what we call the polarity point on the north node. Um, and Tristan, so, yes, I just tune in. I'm wondering how you feel about using some of the time um, that we're that we're adding here to allow for some questions. Of course. Um, because it is starting to get late and I I'm sorry, I don't have any track of time here. No worries. 
but this is also so incredibly riveting. Yeah. So, um, we should probably so, wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Yeah, I'm okay. just at the end here, actually. Go, go I'm for just it. Gonna then, get, we'll, I'm, then we'll allow for some questions. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. Just at the end of this, the takeaway that she gets from this, because she moves, now the healing's happened, she slings shot to the potentiality, and now we can get the higher view of spirit, right? Because now we've healed the soul, soul then moves to spirit. And spirit's higher view then comes in. It's what I call the higher bardos, the, the e eagle eye view. And what was the takeaway from that life was the question. And the higher wisdom says to her, it takes to be, I'm reading her words, it takes to be hurt very deeply to know how to heal deeply. Um, it takes the courage to look into the deep heart hurt and see the chains that are around you and the chains that are around everyone mm. and working through them to finally realize these are external to you, don't belong to you. Little by little, you remember your strength and your roots. And that gives you the power to rip through the chains. Removing those chains is the beginning of true living. And they said that life was so extreme. So it got you to see the chains and that this is an initiation now, right? Um, and feeling coming out of that pain and darkness. And now she said after it, and this was really interesting because she lives, I guess her own, she has her own sailboat with her husband and they live docked off Belgium somewhere, but near a red light district. And she said, she's always so disturbed by the women there. It's very much like the Amsterdam red light district and that she just wants to go and liberate them. Again, look at the moon. Um, yeah, if you jump the North node on the MC. Um, and, and she said, now I can help others to notice the chains and welcome all of them, their pain, their darkness what's hideous about them and hold space for them so that they can see their own limitations and eventually their potential, blah, 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 blah. It goes on, she had a longer dialogue, but the most important part here is look at that beautiful expression of that Virgo Pisces axis, right? That's natural, that's a natural healer. She does re-meet the indigenous healers again. They have a whole bunch of stuff going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> so Patricia, let's move into some Q&A and we really yeah. should probably only give a, th a few minutes because we need to get moving ourselves. Okay. So I'm going to pick a couple questions here. Let me just um, stop my share and come back. So the question okay. that we see is um, from um, Teresa, what does she need to say to her current employers? Is she inclined to use her anger in a constructive and empowering way to liberate herself in this yes. life? And I think you addressed that. But. Yes. Well, it happened after the first regression where she felt like rather than being reactive and angry and repressing the anger because she couldn't express it, that she could come back to them and just be herself and express things. Now, her current life employers are different. Um, and she's ending that contract naturally and will never go back there again. <laughs> the other question is, do you feel she is a Damien soul? You know, potentiality for sure. Yes, I would say. Beautiful. Um, oh, here, this is a question from Amy P. What inspiration or encouragement might you share for someone who is totally naive to evolutionary astrology? but felt called to participate in this weekend is for all the presenters. So maybe as we make our final announcements, we mm. can actually address that. Um, and is there a way to study astrology or regression therapy with you, Patricia? Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, you can look at my website. I, I have, I'm starting a new level. Um, hold on, I'm just clicking on a technology. Um, I'm starting a new level in uh, next year, February. Beautiful. In North Carolina. And, you know, any questions you have about any of the presenters, you can go on the EA forum and just ask and we'll help direct you. I wanted to share one thought about this. Uh, what really touched me was all of these experiences of disillusionment and losing a sense of meaning. And then you hear that her, her lesson is to know who she is, right? It's like this, it gives so much perspective on that question, why do we suffer? Mm. And to see that the deeper gift and offering in this deep soul empowerment, Neptune eighth, uh, eighth and this faith in the journey and the unknown Pisces ninth, that the core of the healing was to actually have this suffering, but to ultimately realize that who I am can't suffer. Like, wow. Yeah. Um, 
to consider that and to open to that possibility of that teaching is just so beautiful. Well, and to know that it's also part of the initiation, right? We, we, that is the healer's journey, right? We live in the, in the era of the wounded healer. Like you can't fake it. You can't take somebody where you haven't been yourself. If you're really going to do it, you have to do your own work and live those kinds of lives, unfortunately. Well, Patricia, thank you so much for this talk. I think everyone here was just deeply riveted and it worked out perfectly that you're the last person so we can create the space. <laughs> right. um, we're going to formally close the container of this conference. Um, Michelle's here. Uh, Kristen, if you're here, um, Michelle, would you like to take it away with some final words to everyone? Yeah, I don't see Kristen. I know she wants to join us. Oh, there she is. She's gonna... here. I saw her. Um, so that she can, yeah. Kristen, do you want to kick it off? <laughs> oh, thank you, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? I don't have my main mic. Yeah, you're good. Well, okay. I just want to thank everybody for an incredible weekend. Wow. I, I'm just, my heart feels full, uh, mainly because just so many of us have been together on this journey for a long time. We've had incredible gatherings in the past and here we are online but it just feels still like a coming together and reconnecting with the community that we love so much and and to share in this work that is so powerful and helping others along the way so it's so exciting to see everybody <laughs> back together again so thank you for joining us and and thank you, Pat, for closing <laughs> this giant weekend. It's three hours later where you are. I know it's late. So thank you so much for that. I'm seeing so many familiar faces on the screen here. <laughs> Good to see you all. So I know you have some announcements, Michelle. I'll let you do that part. But Yeah, I just want to share my appreciation to all of the speakers. Um, when we put together this conference, we just thought of all the, you know, amazing people that we could think of to bring together and really each person dove into these teachings with um, such a care for what they were called to do. And I just really appreciate that so much. And um, I want to thank Ari and Kristen for supporting me, uh, especially Ari. He's been holding it down all day as much as I have been all these days. And so we're really, um, really grateful to this whole community of people who came together for this conference. It was the first time we've done this, and I just feel deeply honored to have been able to do this. Um, Lastly, I want to say that I will be sending out lots of email reminders with access to the links and how to how to watch the replays, how to download, how to get the PDFs. So if you're patient and open to your email, you will find an abundance of information that will come to you very quickly. Um, we have in the works are plans already for next year's association series and really excited to be diving into a deeper lens of evolutionary astrology through the planetary pairs. And in addition to focusing on the planetary pairs, so I'm talking about like Pluto, Mars, Moon, Saturn, we will have everyone who joins us for that will get a bonus of a five hour original lecture of Jeffrey Wolf Green teaching the planetary method of chart interpretation. So it's really going to be a beautiful way for us to come together again and deepen in this as a part of the association that'll be available to members to register um, shortly after the conference ends. And we'll make sure to let you know we would love for you to join us and just continue to grow this community of resources and knowledge and support these teachers in evolutionary astrology. So grateful for everyone. Um, and the School of EA, the School of Ever Evolutionary Astrology also has all of the original teachings of Jeffrey Wolf Green that were on DVDs and 
They've now been transferred to USB drive. So those teachings are available. I know somebody asked like, where do I begin? What do I do? There's so much even just to digest from this whole weekend. And I would say, begin with the core desire of your soul that has brought you here. Whatever the questions are that you're sitting with, that is the most potent place to open into where we have so much resources to grow together. So thank you. So I wanna uh, speak to that also a little bit. Uh, yeah, so to your question, Amy P, I think everyone here knows there's the Jeffrey Wolf Green AEA website, um, which Michelle put together. It's sort of the continuation of something that I don't know if everyone here knows for many, many years, like a decade and a half was school of evolutionary astrology.com. There's an archive on that website to many, many years of message board material, lots of practice, lots of deep, good learning articles. It's super quality. Um, on the Jeffrey Wolf Green AEA website, you'll have a link to that. So in terms of learning, um, the website shows all the ways to access the Jeff Green content and use the forum. For anyone studying, this is a service, this is a free forum um, that many of the teachers of EA are available to support students that are wanting to study this work. And many of the teachers of this work are also offering their own tutoring, their own classes. So follow your own soul guidance. If you're drawn to any of the presenters from this weekend, reach out. And there are many avenues available to study and train in this work, many beautiful avenues. Um, I wanna say too, when you're gonna get an email from Michelle, we're going to include in that a survey. It's really, really highly requested and appreciated that you fill out the survey. We created this association to both make the teachings of EA more available in the year 2023, also to really support the teachings, honor the school and support the teachers of this work. We wanna to continue to grow in what we're creating to create really quality, well-presented content. And one thing that we appreciate is continuing to work with uh, those who have been a part of this work for many years and bringing in new teachers that are just blossoming in their path to the EA to support them in their teaching. Your feedback about this conference will really help us understand how we can improve and strengthen what we're offering to become even better and better in terms of content and presentation and all the pieces. Okay, so please do fill that out. And yes, I think that's it on my end. We have a final question and I wonder also if um, Patricia, maybe if you want to answer this question or um, Kristen or Ari, what makes evolutionary astrology different than other lenses of astrology? Three syllables, just longer. Yeah. It's a longer time to say it. <laughs> Go for it, Kristen. Okay. It's, it's really simple. Uh, evolutionary astrology answers the question why, not just what, not just what's happening that we can see reflected in all the symbols, but it answers the question, why is this happening to me? Why have I called this in? Why have I created it? It's a Scorpio word. And Pluto is the symbol that connects to the soul, the deeper levels and layers of what we're looking to uncover so we can actually grow and evolve instead of repeating our patterns. So we are answering why so we can move on, so we can evolve, so we can yeah. heal. And I would just add to that, you know, you can look at astrology and just grasp a social or psychological or habit or personality perspective. What this offers is fundamentally a soul perspective, looking at everything in our chart, everything in our life from the soul point of view, from the point of view of we're here on this earth for evolution. So that's simply the reference point that we're bringing into our read of the needle chart. Thank you. I'm wondering if we should have another little gathering at some point just to answer questions in general. What do you guys think about that? Like a a, a, a follow-up conference, you know, free yeah. gathering Q and A, just just to share questions and interact a little more casually on these okay. things. How does that sound, guys? I say let's meditate on that, Ari. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I would also say that we're also planning another retreat slash um, conference for later in the year next year that will be more focused. Then this, um, this was, you know, we covered a lot of topics 
in this weekend, and we're planning to take it even deeper into um, the asteroid goddesses over a, a period of time. So, yes, and I'm all I'm all for more community connection and interaction. So, Ari, let's meditate on that and how we can tune in first, then announce it. I get it. <laughs> yes. All right, everyone. Thank you so very much. And may all that has been shared in this weekend serve all souls in their path and their purpose and the way that we are all working to return to source. And may it all be for good and all be for healing. And may you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much.